All right. Thanks for tuning in. You are listening to Gnostic Studies, and we'd like to continue our lecture series on the uh, Tarot and Kabbalah and the Gnostic tradition. As we've been doing, we want to do a quick review of the previous class, referring to the handout that is available on that page uh, that we're reading from, which we'll put in the comments area. So at the bottom of the page, there's a PDF, and that's the, the one that uh, we're looking at right now. So we studied Arcanum 20, Resh. The English names, uh, some of which are translations from other languages, but the important part is to understand that when we do something like this, where we look at these different names, we can get the synthesis of the hieroglyphic, which is the tarot card because it's trying to teach us something, right? So for Arcanum 20, it was Judgment. That's typically the name we see in English. Resurrection. It's a Spanish card. has that. And French card says Awakening. The meaning of the card, the resurrection of the dead. Favorable changes, take advantage of them. Put an end to weaknesses. The resurrection of the soul is only possible through cosmic initiation. Human beings are dead and can only revive themselves by means of initiation. Remember what we said in the first class, quoting from Manual of Practical Magic by Samael and Vewer. He says, initiation is our life itself. It's how we live, how we are, what we do. And so he explained in the um, description of the card that this is the symbol of the soul. This is, we could say, the, the dead person and the soul the solar astral body, solar mental body, solar causal bodies, is symbolized by a sparrow head with a sparrow hawk with a human head. And then it has a little symbol that's the pineal gland on both. The transcendental axiom, apple tree in bloom, fruit on the vine, sown in maturity. We're going to skip the explanation of the card because we covered that in the class. And we refer you to that class. But what we are interested in is the related explanation, which as usual is from Eliphas Levy, a Frenchman. He says, the 20th Hebrew letter is Resh, whose hieroglyph is the trough a long, narrow receptacle for holding food and water for animals. The trough of the, of the tomb, which we could say is where you dig the, the hole to put a body into, a hole in the ground. So the hieroglyph uh, is the trough of the tomb or judgment. It is destruction and regeneration, the remembrance of everything or the great arcanum of eternal life. Whosoever seeks and finds a glorious death has faith in immortality. But what we call death is actually change. It is their perpetuity, 
or perpetuation of life, ever renewing itself at the call of the divine verb. It is through willful and effective movement, through action, that life develops and dresses itself in new forms. So the developments of life in itself and the birth of new forms we call creation. The intelligent power that operates in a transcendental and absolute way within the universal movement we call the divine verb. It is the initiative of God which can never remain without effect nor can it stop itself without having reached its goal. He's talking about the verb of God, the divine verb. And that's um, a helpful way to understand the meaning behind the uh, book of John where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you take Word and make it verb, in the beginning was the verb, and the verb was with God, and the verb was God. Then you can see, and if we study such as has been done in the Mystery Religions of the Ancient series, the creation uh, stories from various religious systems. And you see that the, the word or verb is used in order to create in multiple religious systems. We want to understand that because if we're going to incarnate that verb in ourselves, which is what the meaning of religion is, then we need to understand it and we need to put it into effect, into action. Or what we could say, movement, momentum. And as we've been teaching, studying this, these arcana, we learn the Gnostic philosophy of mystical death the concept that we need to eliminate the ego in order to be born to something different, to this change. So understand that in relation to the symbolism present in the card. See the different cards at the bottom of the handout. The uh, other page, the other part of the page, the second page of the handout is Selecting and Transforming Impressions. And this is related with something that's covered in the uh, Fourth Way School as well, the, the concept of impressions. So we receive information through the five senses. And we're going to talk more about that today in today's class. So let's get into it. If you want to download this handout that you see on your screen right now, the link is in the uh, chat. Oh. All right. So let's get into today's class. We're going to study our kingdom 21. The link to the class if you want to follow along online is there in the chat as well. Greetings to everyone who's joining and has already joined. Today's class, Arcanum 21. Very interesting Arcanum. This one takes us back to the first class, the very first class that we covered the one on uh, Egyptian origin of the tarot, where we talked about how Arcanum 21 is sometimes confused with Arcanum 22, uh, sometimes it's given the value zero. So we'll look at that uh, in the handout specifically, so at the beginning of the next class, but we'll look at the associations today of uh, Arcanum 21. It corresponds to the Hebrew letter Sheen, which looks sort of like a W 
with lines on top of it, or waves, or whatever you want to call it. It is the letter, one of the three mother letters that we discussed in the Arcanum 3 in Gimel. And this um, letter corresponds to fire. Aleph corresponds to air, the first Arcanum. Mem, the 13th Arcanum, corresponds to water. Shin corresponds to fire. So when you understand that, then you look at the symbols. You see they all have that W type shape or some kind of thing coming up. Kind of look like a little fire or little flames. Arcanum 21. It can be represented by the pentagonal star inverted, which represents black magic. Arcanum 21 is failure, foolishness, the lunatic of the tarot. One who works in self-realization is exposed to committing insanity. One must work with the three factors for the revolution of the consciousness. Number one, to die. Right? We're talking about mystical death. We're talking about psychological death. The uh, initiatic death. Internal. Not external. We're not talking about killing the physical body. We're talking about elimination of the ego. Internal process. Number two, to be born. This is the creation of the solar bodies. Transmutation of the creative energies. White Tantra. Number three, sacrifice for others. Sometimes called sacrifice for humanity. Right? Helping fellow human beings. Those are the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness. To die, to be born, and sacrifice for others. Transmutation. As the name implies... It indicates that one must transmute. The brain must control sex. When the brain loses control over sex, then sex achieves the domination of the brain. Then, the star of five points, the human being, goes headfirst into the abyss. This is the inverted pentagram, the symbol of black magic. In this arcanum, the danger is indicated with precision, by the crocodile. Hebrew letter, Hebraic letter, Shin. Hour, the twelfth hour of Apollonius. The towers of fire are disturbed. This is the triumphant entry of the master into the limitless joy of Nirvana. Or, on the other hand, the renunciation of the joy of nirvana or love of humanity and is converted into the master is then converted into a bodhisattva of compassion. Transcendental axiom My soul does not enter in their secret nor does my ship enter their harbor. All right, we're going to begin with our first reading from Manual of Practical Magic. Chapter is called Transmutation, Shin. Subtitle, Meditation. Those who cannot come out in the astral body owe it to having lost the faculty. And then they have to reconquer this faculty through daily meditation. Meditation is a scientific system to receive internal information. When the magician submerges him or herself into meditation, they abandon the physical body and converse and can converse with the sidereal gods. Meditation covers four phases. 
asana. That's the posture of the body. The body should remain in an absolutely comfortable position. Dharayana. I'm sorry, dharana. Concentration. We should separate the mind from all types of earthly thoughts. Earthly thoughts should fall dead before the doors of the temple. One has to concentrate the mind only within, on our intimus, our inner being. Dhyana, meditation. The disciple should meditate in those instants on the intimus, the inner being. Intimus is the spirit. Remember that thy bodies are the temple of the living God and that the Most High dwells in us. The disciples should fall asleep, profoundly trying to converse with their intimus. And the fourth stage of meditation, or phase, shamadi, or samadhi sometimes it's pronounced, ecstasy. If the disciple has been able to fall asleep meditating on their intimus, then they enter the state of shamadhi, and they can see and hear ineffable things and converse with the angels in a familiar manner. It is in this way that one awakens consciousness from one's millenniary lethargy. It is in this manner that we can acquire true divine wisdom without the need of harming the powers of the mind with the battle of reasoning, nor with vain intellectualism. Meditation is the daily bread of the wise. With meditation, our astral body is transformed. Our astral experiences are made clear during the hours of sleep, and in this way we reconquer our powers and learn to come out in the astral body at will. Then, they will be able to use it with success. The clues that we gave in the, they will be able to use with success the clues that we gave in the chapter of Gimel, or the Empress. Number three. With meditation, we can function without the four bodies of sin in the world of the mist of fire. During the hours of sleep, every human being functions in the astral body. Dreams are astral experiences. Upon awakening, we should force ourselves to remember all our astral experiences. During sleep, every person is outside their physical body. So this is a subject that he talks about often, the need to be able to remember our astral experiences and to be able to get out in astral at will. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the comments area. Now reading from our second book, Esoteric Course of Kabbalah, 21st Arcanum. <clears throat> Let us now study Arcanum 21 of the Tarot. The hieroglyphic of this Arcanum is the lunatic. In French, it's le fou, which means the crazy. Examining this Arcanum, we can see the unfortunate poor lunatic who wanders aimlessly, without direction, with a shoulder bag within which he carries all of his absurdities and vices. His clothes are in disarray, leaving his creative organs exposed, and a cat following him that bites him incessantly, and he does not even try to defend himself. Observe also here we have a crocodile and an obelisk that has been overturned. This is an excellent card from a uh, French artist from, uh, I believe it's 1889, Oswald Wirth. He did it based on the descriptions of uh, El Levy. 
There's also a, looks like a, a flower that's wilting. In this arcanum, we find sensitivity represented, the flesh, material life. We could also represent this arcanum with the inverted blazing star. Every initiate that allows themselves to fall is really the lunatic of the tarot. There's a question, is this connected with the apron? It is, in the sense that the apron covers what? The apron of the mysteries covers the front, right? It covers our creative organs. And in this case, the um, creative organs are exposed. Because this is related with how we manage that creative energy. When the alchemist spills the cup of Hermes, they in fact convert themselves into the lunatic of the tarot. It is necessary to annihilate desire if we want to avoid the danger of falling. Let me read that to you again. It is necessary to annihilate desire if we want to avoid the danger of falling. Many masters who swallowed soil, even many resurrected masters, fell and converted themselves into the lunatic of Arcanum 21 of the Tarot. It is enough to remember Zanoni during the French Revolution. He was a resurrected master, and nonetheless he allowed himself to fall when he fell in love with an actress from Naples. Zanoni died by the guillotine after having lived with the same physical body for thousands of years. Whosoever wants to annihilate desire must discover its causes. The causes of desire are found in sensations. We live in a world of sensations, and we need to comprehend them. So before we continue reading, let's just remember that the foundation, we could say the, the um, important points of Buddhism revolve around desire, right? Desire causes suffering, the, the Four Noble Truths. Desire causes suffering. And so this speaks also to that, to understanding how to end our own suffering. We live in a world of sensations. The causes of desire are found in sensations. We live in a world of sensations and we need to comprehend them. There are five types of sensations. First, visual sensations. Second, auditory sensations. Third, olfactory sensations. Fourth, gustatory sensations. Fifth, tactile sensations related with the sense of touch. So visual and auditory, we know what those are, right? Seeing and hearing. Olfactory is smelling. Gustatory is tasting. So, the five senses. Sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. Those are the sensations. The five special types of sensations transform themselves into desire. Therefore, the causes of desire are found within sensations. How do we handle sensations, which we could say are related with impressions? How do we handle impressions that we receive through the five senses? We must not condemn sensations, nor must we justify them. We neither condemn them nor justify them. We need to profoundly comprehend them. A pornographic image strikes the senses and then passes to the mind, 
and the outcome of this perception is a sexual sensation which is soon transformed into animal desire. After passing through the sense of hearing and through the cerebral center of sensations, a vulgar morbid type of song is converted into sexual desire. Right? We listen to some songs and the things that they say, the, the, um, the sounds, they can convert into sexual desire. We see a luxurious car. We sense it, and thereafter, we desire it. We taste a delicious cup of alcohol. We perceive its odor with our sense of smell and feel its delicious sensations. And thereafter, we desire to drink more and more until we become inebriated. Therefore, smell and taste turn us into gluttons and drunkards. The sense of touch places itself under the service of all of our desires. And then the eye, the ego, receives pleasure from amidst the vices and wanders like the lunatic of the tarot from life to life with its bag within which it carries all of its vices and absurdities on his shoulders. Whosoever wants to annihilate desire must first intellectually analyze the sensations and then profoundly comprehend them. It is impossible to profoundly comprehend the contextual concept within a sensation with only the intellect, since the intellect is just a small fraction of the mind. If we want to profoundly comprehend all the substantial context of a certain sensation of any kind, we then indispensably need the technique of internal meditation. It is urgent to profoundly comprehend in all the levels of the mind. The mind has many subconscious and unconscious levels and depths which are normally unknown to the human being. Many individuals who have achieved absolute chastity here in the physical world become terrible fornicators in other levels and profundities of the mind when they are submitted to difficult ordeals in the internal worlds. Great anchorites and holy hermits discovered with horror that the lunatic of the tarot continues living in other more profound levels of their understanding. Really only by comprehending the sensations in all the wrinkles of the mind can we annihilate desire and kill the lunatic of the tarot who hides among all of the wrinkles of the mind. It is necessary for the student to learn how to see and hear without translating. It's important to understand the meaning of translating in this context. When a man perceives the beautiful figure of a woman and commits the error of translating that perception into the language of his sexual desires, then the outcome is sexual desire. This type of desire, even when it is forgotten, continues living internally in other unconscious levels of the mind. This is how the I, the ego, incessantly fornicates in the internal worlds. Therefore, it is important to learn how to see without translating, to see without judging, or uh, as some others say, to to let things be what they are without allowing the ego to, to feed, to translate, to convert the image into something else. In this case, an image it could be a smell, it could be a, a touch, it could be a sound. It is indispensable to see, hear, taste, smell, and touch with creative comprehension. Only in this way are we able to annihilate the causes of desire. Really, the tree of desire has roots that we must study and profoundly comprehend. 
upright perception and creative comprehension annihilate the causes of desire. When the mind escapes from the bottle of desire, it elevates itself to the superior worlds. Then the awakening of the consciousness arrives. Normally the mind is found bottled up within the bottle of desire. Thus it is indispensable to take the mind out of the bottle, if indeed what we want is the awakening of the consciousness. It is impossible to awaken consciousness without taking the mind out of the bottle. We constantly hear complaints from many Gnostic students who suffer because during the sleep of their physical bodies, they unconsciously live within the superior worlds. Many of them have performed many esoteric practices in order to achieve astral projection, yet they do not succeed. When we study the life of these whiners, we discover within them the lunatic of the tarot. These people are full of desires. Only by comprehending the sensations can we kill desire. Only by annihilating desire do we liberate the mind, which is normally found bottled up within desire. By liberating the mind, the awakening of the consciousness is produced. The lunatic of the tarot is the psychological I, the ego, the myself, the reincarnating or returning ego. If we indeed want to finish with all the causes of desire, then we need to live in a state of constant vigilance. It is urgent to live in a state of alert perception, alert novelty, right? newness. Novelty is like something new. The I, the ego, is a great book, a book of many volumes. Only by means of the technique of internal meditation will we be able to study that book. When we discover and profoundly comprehend a defect in all the levels of the mind, then this defect is disintegrated. Each time a defect is disintegrated, something new occupies its place. A password, a mantra, some cosmic initiation, an esoteric degree, a secret power, etc. This is how we fill ourselves, little by little, with true wisdom. Arcanum 21. The Kabbalistic addition of this Arcanum gives us the following result. 2 plus 1 equals 3. 1 is the father, Keter. 2 is the son, or child, Chokmah. 3 is the Holy Spirit, Binah. This is the resplendent dragon of wisdom within every human being that comes into the world. We also call this the Logoic Triangle, or the Logos. Logos is Greek, same as the verb. Trinity. Anyone who achieves the disillusion of the psychological eye, the fool or lunatic of the tarot, incarnates their resplendent dragon of wisdom. Whosoever incarnates it, in fact, becomes a spirit of wisdom. Interrelations. It is not by isolating ourselves from our fellow human beings that we are able to discover our defects. It is only by means of interrelations that we self-discover ourselves. In interrelations with our fellow human beings, we can surprise our defects because they flourish or come forth in our human personality. They spring forth. Self-discovery and self-revelation exist in social interrelations. When we discover a defect, we must first analyze it intellectually and thereafter comprehend it in all the inner layers of the mind by means of the technique of meditation. 
it is necessary to concentrate on the discovered defect and meditate on it with the intention of profoundly comprehending it. Meditation must be combined with the state of slumber. Thus, this is how, by means of profound wisdom, I'm sorry, by means of profound vision, we become conscious of the defect we are trying to comprehend. Once the defect is dissolved, something new arrives. It is necessary to be in a state of alert perception and alert novelty during internal meditation. In order to receive that something new, each defect must be replaced with something new. This is how the human being becomes truly wise. This is the path of wisdom. Intuition As we dissolve the lunatic of Arcanum 21 of the Tarot, intuition is developed. This is the flower of intelligence. Intuition and comprehension replace reasoning and desire. The latter two are the attributes of the I, the ego. Intuition allows us to penetrate into the past, into the present, and into the future. Intuition allows us to penetrate into the deeper meaning of all things. Intuition grants us entrance into the world of the ineffable gods. Any intuitive initiate converts themselves into a true prophet. Practice for the development of intuition. It is urgent for the devotee of the path of the razor's edge to intensify the development of intuition. This faculty resides in the coronary chakra. The chakra shines in the pineal gland, which is the seat of the soul, the third eye. Modern scientists believe that they know more that they know more than the old sages from the ancient schools of mysteries, and thus they deny all these things related with the pineal gland and take it only to purely physiological take it only to the purely physiological side pretending with this to slap the faces of the great hierophants with a white glove which used to be the uh, the technique to um, to start a duel with someone The old sages from ancient times never ignored that the pineal gland or pineal gland is a small reddish-gray cone-shaped tissue located in the posterior part of the brain. They knew very well that the hormone that is secreted by this gland is intimately related with the development of the sexual organs and that after maturity, this gland degenerates into fibrous tissues that no longer secrete such a hormone and then impotence arrives. There only exists one exception in all of this, that of the Gnostics. They preserve the activity of their pineal gland and its sexual function throughout the whole of their life with sexual magic, white tantra. The pineal gland is the center of intuitive polyvoyance. Intuition manifests in the heart as premonitions, premonitions or what we could call hunches. I have a hunch. Sometimes people call it gut, gut feeling. Um, but we're talking about the heart. Intuition manifests in the heart as premonitions, but in the pineal gland, those premonitions become intuitive images. It is urgent that our devotees practice the powerful mantra of intuition. This mantra is the following. Trin, T-R-I-N, is pronounced like this. i got to look at the level so I don't blow out the mic. 
Prolong the sound of the vowel I and of the consonant N, giving it tones similar to a bell. Trrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
are esoterically associated in the same work of mystical death. The dog is the sexual fire, the erotic instinct which is found at the very root of our seminal system. Right, so remember, sheen is the letter of the fire. The tiger is different, and this is known by the tiger knights, those jaguars who fight against the ego, those true felines of revolutionary psychology who have pitted themselves against themselves, against their own psychological defects. Really, the sagacity and the ferocity Ferocity? Ferocity? Really, the sagacity and the ferocity of the tiger are necessary in order to kill the human personality and make the dragon of wisdom of seven serpents, symbols of the decapitated human being, shine in the human being. So let, let's back up and understand this. We talked about the dragon of wisdom. It's related with the verb, the logos, Keter Hokma Bina, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity. When we eliminate the ego, then we can incarnate the dragon of wisdom. The seven serpents are related with the seven bodies, uh, of which we've studied five the physical, the etheric, astral, mental, causal. Then there's two more. Uh, the buddhic body and the atmic body we'll study more about this in uh, in other classes and in the gnostic astrology class i'm trying to remember which one it is i think it's in the about this time of year um, so what are we in sagittarius i think it talks about it in there then he talks about the decapitation. Decapitation in the mystical or esoteric sense is related with the cutting off of the head of uh, meaning el complete elimination of the ego. The reason that we want to, quote, kill the human personality is because right now, the way that it is, the personality dominates the essence. This is something we mention in uh, Gnostic psychology classes um, 6 and 7, Introduction to Gnostic Psychology, if you want to review that material. Personality needs to become passive so that the essence, the spark of divinity, can become active. Esoteric significance of Arcanum 21. Arcanum 21 has been confused with Arcanum 22, which is the crown of life. Arcanum 21 is the fool, the lunatic of the tarot, or transmutation. The Kabbalistic sum, 2 plus 1, gives 3. Right? That's why it's related with uh, Keter Hokma Bina, with the Trinity. In this Arcanum 21, the initiate has to fight against the three traitors of Hiram Abif. You guys know who Hiram Abif is? The three traitors of Hiram Abif are the demon of desire, the demon of the mind, and the demon of ill will. Hiram Abif is the uh, symbol of the hero or the Christ in um, in Freemasonry. Chiram Osiris, sometimes it's referred to as the, the Osiris, who's the Christ in the Egyptian system. One is never in more danger of being a demon than when one is closest to being an angel. Every initiate who allows themselves to fall is really the lunatic of the tarot. When the alchemist spills the vessel of Hermes, then they in fact become the fool or lunatic of the tarot. 
It is necessary to eliminate desire if we want to avoid the danger of falling. Whosoever wants to annihilate desire must discover its causes. The causes of desire are to be found in sensations. We live in a world of sensations and we need to understand them. There are five types of sensations. We talked about this, right? Visual, auditory, so seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. The five special types of sensations are transformed into desire. We must not condemn the sensations. We must not justify them. We must profoundly comprehend them. Only by comprehending the sensations do we kill desire. Only by annihilating desire can the mind be liberated, which is normally found trapped within the bottle of desire. Liberating the mind produces the awakening of the consciousness. If we want to put an end to the causes of desire, then we need to live in a constant state of vigilance. It is urgent to live in a state of alert perception, alert novelty. The I, the ego, is a great book, a book of many volumes. Only by means of the technique of internal meditation can we study that book. Very short, right? Esoteric significance, straight to the point. Initiatic significance of Arcanum 21. This is chapter 43 of the same book. This Arcanum is the lunatic of the tarot, or transmutation. It has been confused with Arcanum 22, which is the crown of life. Arcanum 21 can be represented by the inverted pentagonal star, which symbolizes black magic. In, in esoteric schools, it is emphatically affirmed that we have a luminous astral body. Yet this is very debatable, because the astral body must be created in the ninth sphere through the transmutations of the hydrogen C12. Right? We have a lunar astral body, but that doesn't mean we have a solar astral body. In order to possess our soul, in order to be born again, in the Christian terminology, we need to transmute our creative energy in order to create something internally. That creative energy is called the hydrogen C12 in Gnostic chemistry and cosmology. When the average person, what the average person possesses, is the body of desire. Remember that the three the three traitors, the ones who killed Hiram of Biff, who killed the internal Christ, the demon of desire, the demon of the mind, and the demon of ill will, is the lunar astral body, lunar mental body, lunar causal body. What the average person possesses is the body of desire, which is confused with the astral body. This is a grave error, a tremendous mistake, because the body of desire is not the astral body. In the Egyptian mysteries, that body is known as Apopi. This is the demon of desire. That demon is frightfully dangerous, and to think that everyone has it, that the whole world is evil, in order to cease being so, it is possible. In order to cease being so, is only possible through the efforts and super efforts of this path. Only in this way will we cease to be demons. His language is very harsh, right? It's not necessarily something people like to hear. Mr. Ledbetter describes the mental body as a marvelous yellow body with a resplendent aura. The mental body is mentioned by everyone as being sublime. However, when one studies it, one discovers that it is not the authentic mental body, the solar mental body. 
the authentic mental body is created with the transmutations of the hydrogen C12, a body which precisely comes from Adam. Thus, the mental body which people presently have is another demon, which in the Egyptian mysteries is known as the demon Hai. It is terribly perverse, and just as in the Egyptian mysteries, it must be put to death and decapitated in the sphere of Mercury. Theosophy speaks to us about the causal body, but the human being does not have the causal body, but rather the demon of ill will, called Nebt in the Egyptian mysteries. The demon of desire, the demon of the mind, and the demon of ill will are the three furies which classical mythology speaks. They are, which we should say in English, which classical mythology speaks about. They are the three assassins of Hiram Abiff, the three traitors who crucify the Christ, Judas, Pilate, and Caiaphas, the tr three traitors that Dante found in the Ninth Circle, Judas, Brutus, and Cassius. In order to incarnate the real being, the solar bodies must be created through the transmutation of the hydrogen C12, and we must convert ourselves into true human beings. But to reach this state, the ego must be dissolved, so as not to become a Hanas Musen with a double center of gravity, like, for example, Andromelech. A Hanas Musen is a master of the Black Lodge and of the White Lodge, because if we don't eliminate our ego, then we're still connected to the Black Lodge through the ego. In the East, some sects call Hanas Musen Marut, and some of the Mohammedan sects render cult to them. The Hanas Musen has worked in the forge of the Cyclops. They've transmuted, but they haven't dissolved the ego. Thus they are abortions of the Cosmic Mother. Arcanum 21 is failure, or the lunatic of the tarot. Transmutation indicates that one must transmute. In the work of self-realization, one is exposed to the risk of committing follies, foolishness. One must work with the three factors of the revolution of the consciousness. To die, to be born, and sacrifice for humanity. The disillusion of the ego is necessary because it is nothing other than a sum of tenebrous entities. We have reached the conclusion that every human being must dissolve the ego. The seeds must be incinerated, and afterwards one must bathe in the river Lethe in order to put an end to the memories of the past, and after the confirmation in the light, one is then received by the White Brotherhood. Here the documents are signed, and one is then taught that one must be careful. From that instant, one must draw back the veil of Isis, which pertains to sex. If the woman is not in agreement with the Maithuna, then she does not work, and the man should do so in silence, and vice versa. If the man is not in agreement with the work in the Maithuna, then the woman should work in silence. Do you guys know what that means? It means that if our spouse doesn't want to transmute, then that's their choice. We have to let them have their free will, and we need to work in silence. We do what we do, and they do what they do. The most difficult thing is the destruction of the lunar bodies. Whosoever dissolves the ego has very fertile ground. So the man or woman who is already old must make use of their time in order to dissolve the ego, awaken consciousness, and attain illumination. While the man or woman is married, he or she must work in the ninth sphere. One is not alone, but is helped by the father-mother. She helps like the mother who looks out for her son, and he also helps. But if one violates the oath of chastity, 
then one falls and is abandoned by one's mother, being submitted to pain and bitterness. Remember what we've been talking about from the beginning. Don't spill the cup of Hermes. In Arcanum 21, danger is clearly indicated by the crocodile. The folly, the error, is to stray from the path. The path of the razor's edge. Our single disciples of both sexes can practice transmutation, transmuting their sexual energy with the Olin rune. Okay, we have a whole section about the runes. The Olin rune is uh, the Os and Othil runes combined together. And in this case, he also adds the work with the uh, rune Dorn or Thorn. So he's going to explain how to do the practice. It's important to understand these esoteric practices because their use is to transmute the creative energy. When we feel that onslaught, that attack of lust, whether it be internally from ourselves or from someone else trying to stimulate that in us, we can take advantage of this practice to transmute our energy, to dominate the energy so that it does not dominate us. Remember what it said at the beginning. The brain has to dominate sex. Sex cannot dominate the brain because if sex dominates the brain, then we fall. And that's how we uh, deviate ourselves from the path. So this is the practice. In a standing position, the disciple would inhale and exhale rhythmically several times. Just breathing in. It's ideal if you breathe in through your nose and exhale through your mouth. Or you can inhale and exhale through your nose when you're not doing mantras, but breathing in through your nose is, is ideal. In keeping with the inhalation of air, the imagination and willpower must be united in vibrant harmony so as to make the sexual energy rise through the two ganglionic cords of the spine until it reaches the brain, eyebrow center, neck, and heart in successive order. Let me explain. So, if you've seen a picture of the caduceus of Mercury, it is a, a staff or stick or a, a line straight up and down. And then it has two snakes that weave back and forth, crossing at certain points along the back, along that stick. So that's in, if we imagine that stick as our spine, then the beginning of the snakes is in the uh, coccyx, in the very base of the spine, right where the uh, sexual organs are. So we want to pull the energy from there up the spine, and we can imagine it going uh, like a snake, weaving like those two snakes of the caduceus of Mercury. When it says, until it reaches the brain. So we bring it up from the spine up to the brain, Visualizing, right? That's what he means when he says the imagination and will must be united in vibrant harmony. He means visualize this. Bring the energy up into the brain, into your head. From then you go to the eyebrow center specifically, then down to the neck, and then down to the heart to make like a cane, like an upside down J. Up from the creative organs up through the spine to the back of the head into the brain then to the uh, third eye point and then down to the neck and then down to the heart so you imagine while you're inhaling energy comes up to the head to the brain and then you can imagine while you're holding your breath or as you exhale that it goes to the third eye to the neck, and to the heart. Then the breath will be exhaled, the disciple firmly imagining the sexual energy is secured in the heart. So you're bringing the energy from the creative organs to the heart. So we stand still doing that. Upon exhaling the breath, the disciple will vocalize the mantra, thorn, in this way. Thor. 
Horn. If you can't roll your R's, then then do what you can do. Thorn. So you can also do that while standing in the posture that's in the middle of the graphic, standing with your right hand on your hip, make and your left hand uh, flat against the side of your body because that makes a thorn, which is the Dorn rune, uh, which we can show you, let's see. Looks like that. So you take on the posture, that posture, physically. And then we're going to do the, the practice of the Olin rune, which are these two, which correspond to these two graphics. The disciple should place the right hand upon the waist. We already did that one. That's the thorn rune, right? Then extend both hands towards the left. So you're standing straight. You're both hands towards the left because you're doing this shape. With the left hand higher than the right, stretching the arms and forming a sharp angle with the trunk. Then you place both hands on the waist and you, you step out. You have to step to widen your uh, stance. In this manner, our singles disciples of both sexes can transmute their sexual energy. The sexual energies are also transmuted via the aesthetic sense with the love of music, sculpture, and with long walks. The single person who does not want to have sexual problems must, ab must be absolutely pure in thought word and deed so the way that you do this rune is you put your arms out to the side then you inhale visualizing the energy transmuting going up the spine to the brain to the third eye to the neck to the heart then you step out put your hands on your hips on the waist and then then you do the mantra thorn then step back, put both feet together, arms go to the left, inhale, then step out, put the hands on the hips, do that can do that a bunch of times and if you can't do it out loud because you don't want to wake somebody up or disturb somebody then you whisper it or you do it in your mind but it works it's excellent we also suggest studying pranayama and some other techniques that are very very helpful for transmuting the creative energy lamasaria exercises um, but this is one that's recommended related with this arcanum you can see that it's associated with Arcanum 21, even in the runology. So we have some handouts at the bottom of the page, but we want to open it up for questions and comments. If you have any, please feel free to uh, leave them now. That's, that's the conclusion of the information that we wanted to present related with Arcanum 21. Um, as you can see, if this arcanum is the fool, the the uh, lunatic of the tarot, it's because of the fire. It's associated with our, with uh, the letter Sheen because of the fire, because the fire makes us crazy. The sexual energy makes us into a lunatic. 
because we allow it to dominate us. But when we learn how to dominate it, when we learn how to control the fire, then we become wise. Okay, we got a question. When you do these runes, do you have to be holding your breath? Um, sort of. When you inhale, you hold your breath just for a little bit while you're concentrating on the transmutation, on sending the energy up the spine, into the brain, and then down into the heart. Could these practices be combined into a dance? Or less is more, just curious with the choreography of music and such. You know, uh, I don't know. You could try it. But, you know, you'd want to use good quality music. Music that, that stimulates the superior emotions. Um, some people say that, that Tai Chi is like a dance and Tai Chi can also help balance that energy as well as Qigong. So uh, maybe there's something to that. But I would say first master the, the runes as they're given before you start uh, building, you know. Learn, learn the, the fundamentals, right? Like even in Kung Fu, they, the, the people study the fundamentals over and over and over and over so that they know how to do them really well. And transmutation is fundamental. We need to know how to do that. Because even if we're married, uh, you know, we have to be able to manage our energy. What if we're traveling and we're not with our spouse? What if, uh, you know, they're, they're sick or something, they're not able to uh, participate? We need to manage our energy. It's up to us to learn how to do that. It's our responsibility. All right, well, we want to invite you to the uh, the class next week. We're going to study Arcanum 22 next Thursday, same time. And, uh, well, Thursday in the Northern Hemisphere of North America. Um, 22, that'll conclude, that'll be the end of the uh, major arcana of the 22 Hebrew letters. Then we'll study... The Tetragrammaton, that is the four-lettered name of God. In order to um, look at that briefly, just in a single class, we'll look at that and its relationship with the uh, Gnostic chemistry CONH, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. And then um, after that, we'll study one class on the minor arcana. We'll look at what uh, Elphos Levy Weracocha and Samaelo and Veor have to say about the minor arcana and um, and then we'll be done with this class we'll uh, we'll move into that hermetic masonry which is a a very interesting class it's about the combination of arcana combining arcana together in order to understand them it's basically we're studying more Kabbalah but we're also going to look at some older uh, Masonic texts and practices that they have where they, like catechisms, things that they say, question and answer, and, and we can start to understand the esoteric significance of them. And um, as well as just looking at initiatic knowledge in more detail. Now that we understand Kabbalah, because initiatic knowledge is based on the same information that we've been studying, then we can see, maybe we could say more complex things. We can look at the uh, the passwords or sacred words that are used in various initiatic societies in order to understand their, their profound meaning. So uh, thank you guys. Uh, see some thank yous out there. Thank you for your attention, for your participation in the sense that you were here with us. The class is not possible without you, so we appreciate you 
being here with us and um you know we look forward to talking to you again next week or whenever it may be and in the meantime we want to wish you the best in your esoteric work